Welcome to Chautauqua People. I'm John V. My guest today is Subhag Singh Khalsa. He grew up in Long Island where his father became an engineer and his mother was a clerk. Subhag was a Boy Scout and college athlete. He's a graduate of Brandeis University and the dental school at Tufts where he met his wife. Subsequently, he practiced dentistry for 25 years and lived in Brighton, New York. Chautauquans will know him for his work in establishing and directing the Mystic Heart Meditation Program. Subhag, welcome to the Chautauqua People Table. Thank you. How did you become interested in meditation? Well, uh, that has to go back about 50 years. You're uh, not that old. No, I, I just, I was two years old at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I had gone through this phase of my life from birth until I was mid-20s, uh, reared as a Roman Catholic, and then kind of fell away from that in college. Uh, had a priest who scolded me for not doing everything I was supposed to do. And that was kind of the final straw when he was scolding rather than understanding. And then I spent a few years looking for a way to feel my spirituality. And then, by happenstance, I met a, a spiritual teacher, a man who had come from India and was teaching what was called Kundalini Yoga. And I went to a class figuring, I'll get ready for my spiritual quest. And I got to this class and it was amazing to me. And I went home and told my wife, you gotta do this with me. And we started going to classes and within a few weeks, we had just taken the plunge where we really made some significant lifestyle changes and uh, sort of cleaned up our act, which early 70s wasn't that clean. Mm -hmm. And um, we've been, I've been persistent and consistent with the practices of yoga and meditation and teaching those things ever since. Now just what is meditation? Oh, I guess the, the sage would say, it is nothing. <laughs> it's, um, it's to be empty. It's to be so available to the experience of right now that the experience of right now becomes ever deeper. We're usually not available to that experience because we're reminiscing or remembering our past or we're imagining and planning and or maybe dreading our future. So the one thing that we rarely are is just fully present. Now I look at you and I see you're doing this interview and you're paying attention, you know, but that's an unusual phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Lots of people don't know how to do that. Lots of people would be, oh, thinking of what they're going to say next or wishing they hadn't said that before or wondering how much time has gone by or all kinds of things, mm -hmm. positive and negative. You know? Now, how does your body change during meditation? Oh, well, <laughs> my big body change has happened over the years, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm getting older, I'm feeling my age, I'm physically sore a lot of the time, and when I sit in my meditation, I'm not worried about that, I'm not concerning myself about it, it's just the sensations that happen in my body at that moment it turns out that I can handle those sensations pretty well. What I can handle so well is my thinking about them. What does this mean? What should I do? Who should I go see? You know, all those kinds of things make me focus in on what might hurt. Mm -hmm. Just thinking of my own case where I've got aches and pains. Um, when I'm meditating, my body relaxes because my mind isn't focused in on the bit that I like least. 
Mm -hmm. You know, I'm more attentive to a million sensations. Just the, the, the air moving across my skin or the, the pressure as I sit on my cushion or the taste in my mouth or a million sensations that have no name. It's just this right now. Now you are, have a robust science background. Certainly to get yes. into dental school to go through that. Yeah. Does that interfere with meditation? Well, you know what interferes with meditation is, I don't, and I don't mean this in a dismissive way, but the intellect interferes with meditation. It's all of that figuring out, calculating, planning, that's what interferes with meditation. I mean, I was, yeah, I had a thorough background in science in both undergraduate school and dental school. And when I was working on a patient or with a patient, I had to be paying attention to what was going on in that relation. Mm -hmm. uh, so I couldn't drift off into la la land. I had to be fully aware of what was there at that moment. And I think as a result, I was a gentler, kinder dentist. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that being sensitive to the full picture of that moment allowed me to do that uncomfortable work in a way that was more relaxing for the patient. So they, they understood you were sensitive to them and bigger issues and simply be a small dental problem. Yeah, and towards the end of my practice, the last 10 years of it, I specialized in sort of chronic pain problems that people were facing, head, neck, face, jaw. And my concern was always, how did they get in this situation right now? What was going on in their life that led them to this condition. And I don't mean, oh, years ago you ate too much sugar and now you got a cavity. I mean, why were, there, why were they carrying tension in their, in their shoulders or their jaw? Why were they hurting in this way? And I was able, when things went well, to help people to get rid of the acute problem, but then also start to look at the bigger picture of what their life was like. And, and what, a very common thing was I would treat women who were recent empty nesters. And a common thing was I spent my whole life supporting my family, you know, taking care of my husband. What about me, you know? And when that arose for them that the anxiety around that, the tension around that led to their physical pain, you know. Mm -hmm. So dealing with their life situation rather than mechanically trying to fix their pain was what was most successful. Really? So you have got a certificate of a counseling psychologist also. A lot of my a lot of what we're doing would simply fit into that realm. But. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is phenomena of holistic med medical care. The, the, what we refer to as the biopsychosocial model. There's the biology, what's going on in the physical body. There's the psychological element, what the mind is doing in relation to that. And there's the social element. What, me, what is the milieu in which this body and this mind is operating. And if the, if the environment, the family, the, the job, the you know, conditions of the life are pain inducing, just taking care of the biology isn't gonna solve the problem. Let me pick on this for just a minute. Please. When I uh, understand, I teach psychology in a Baptist institution. Okay. And when that biopsychosocial model comes forward, I point out to our students that we have a divinity school one floor above us, and three floors above us we have 
Department of Religion. Mm -hmm. And I say to the students, is there something beyond the biopsychosocial? And some of them pick up and say, yes, there's a spiritual dimension. All right. How does that fit with your, well, your meditation? I mean, for me, obviously, as somebody who's interested in the, the spiritual practice, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, that's primary. And I don't mean, now I'm, I haven't been a dentist in almost 30 years, so uh, I'm not talking right now about a real recent experience, mm -hmm. but when I would work with a patient, or more importantly, I think, when I would work with myself, if I didn't take into account that more subtle realm, um, those other things, the biology, the psychology, and the social environment, might not get the, uh, the attention that they needed. Mm -hmm. What I mean to say is that attention, paying attention is the most healing thing. The example I always use is a little child, toddler, running around, trips and falls, hurts herself, goes running to mama and cries. And what does the good parent do? She doesn't, you know, run around in a panic and get bandages and, you know, she just gives full attention to the child. I mean, we're not talking about a serious medical emergency, but it's that attention which allows the healing. And my point, I guess, is that attention we can give to ourselves. We can be our own most loving presence. Yeah. You know, because normally what happens is there's a part of us Let's just say the painful part, you know, the arthritic finger. We don't want to feel it. Mm -hmm. That's not, you know, what I want to be experiencing right now. We try to separate ourselves or we focus in all of our attention on that. And neither one works. Neither one gives release, mm -hmm. what I would call healing. Mm -hmm. But what we could call loving attention, which is, I know your pain. I, I can feel what's there, but it's not all there is in the, in the universe right now. Mm -hmm. That combination, not just as words, yeah. but as a practice, that's what, well, it's what kept me from burning out mm -hmm. as a dentist. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's what seemed to me at the time to be the most giving thing I could do. Mm -hmm. And I have a good number of experiences outside of the dental office. You know, as I say, it's been 30 years yeah. almost. Let me talk about one of those. Yeah. What did you get from your parents? What's that now? What, what did you get from your parents? And were there ambitions or dreams your parents had that were communicated to you? Well, it's interesting. I grew up in a time and in a place where it was white, middle-class, suburban America in the 50s, late, early 60s, into the 70s, when the expectation was upward mobility. Mm -hmm. Always, my parents just seemed to assume that I would go off to college and have some sort of a significant career. Mm -hmm. Now, m my father's generation was such that he entered a career and he never left that exact same track. My daughter, who's currently going on near to 40, mm -hmm. has already had three distinct careers. You know, so the expectation back then is very different from what the expectation is now. Now it's all about exploring and finding your, your voice and your inner muses. And, and for my parents, it was get a good career, get a good job, get a good education, stick with it, work hard. 
and be stable and secure. Indeed, but you were an explorer. Well, I was in an exploring generation. Mm -hmm. I came of age in the, the 60s. Everyone was trying new things. Now, I heard you took a canoe down the Hudson River. Yeah. Where, where did that come from? As, um, my father, bless his soul, mm -hmm. being the Mr. Steady, nose to the grindstone guy, used to say to me, I always wished I had taken a canoe down the full length of the Hudson River. And every time I heard him say that, my mind is going, but why didn't you? Why didn't you do it? So I was still practicing as a dentist. It was that time of my life when my father died. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do it as sort of a memorial trip. Mm -hmm. So I bought a canoe, and my wife drove me up to the Adirondacks, and I put my boat in the Hudson, which was a little creek where I was. And I took about three weeks meandering and exploring and heading all the way down through New York Harbor. And it was um, a very eye-opening experience for me. It was when I realized more than ever that I had all kinds of choices in mm -hmm. what I did. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to be a dentist for 50 years. I kind of knew that ahead of time, but this really cemented in my mind, hey, there's all, all kinds of other things that I could be exploring. And, and that kind of set me on a, a path of doing that over maybe about a 20 year period. Let me ask you about one more trip. Yeah. Now, there is a, um, Continental Divide between uh, Mayville, where we are now, and Lake Erie. Yeah. What happened along that team? All right, that's great. I used to go for bike rides with my friends, and we'd go up and over that Continental Divide. Mm -hmm. And for people who don't know, just north of that is the Great Lakes watershed. And there's a place between my home at Chautauqua and uh, the Lunisman Park up on the hill where you can look one way and see Lake Erie, look the other way and see Lake Chautauqua. Lake Chautauqua, of course, is part of the headwaters of the Mississippi watershed. And I realized one day, I'm standing at that place and I could take a kayak from where I was to the Gulf of Mexico. And I thought, I want to do that. But I knew that my wife was getting a little tired of my three-month, two-month trips. Mm -hmm. And so I, what's always happened to me since I started my meditation practice is that my, any ideas that I get occur to me while I'm meditating. So I, you know, I quiet everything else down. And the next morning, I had this thought wait a second, there's the Watershed Conservancy here, concerned about the watershed. Everything I flush winds up in the Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. And it was a year after Katrina. All of us upstream maybe can help those folks downstream. So I set up a little mini project to, to raise some funds mm -hmm. and set off to New Orleans in my kayak with the idea of helping both the Watershed Conservancy and the people in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. My wife met me down there and we spent a few weeks, if I remember how long it was, uh, working for Habitat for Humanity, mm -hmm. helping to rebuild houses. Um, helping to tear down houses that were wrecked, able to give some money to both organizations. And um, along the way, had a deeply <sighs> s 
satisfying time. I felt not that I was just traveling on a river. Mm -hmm. I felt I'm part of this. I'm of the river. You know, and there's a lot of talk mm -hmm. about how we're all connected. Yeah. We're all stardust, literally, you know. We're all sharing the same elephants, elements <laughs> as an elephant. Mm -hmm. um, we're all part of the same phenomena, this universal phenomena. And in that particular trip, more than some of my others, I really felt I'm part of this ocean, uh, this uh, river, this beach, this forest, this planet. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was pretty profound. So would you recommend that experience to others? <laughs> I would recommend that, pe I mean, the simplest thing I would say is I really recommend people getting outdoors. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think we suffer from a nature de de deficit disorder that we're I think our young, a lot of our young people have had no experience uh, camping or just walking in the woods or uh, you know helping on the farm or whatever. People in the suburbs and the cities, um, even in a place like like rural Chautauqua County, young people often don't get outside in any kind of meaningful way. And there's something so fundamental in our connection to the natural world that I think something has to be lost when we cut that off. Yeah, I think I recognize a deficiency also in a lot of young people. Yeah. Let yeah. me change the gears for just a minute. Sure. And tell me about Mystic Heart Meditation. Okay. How Go that ahead. was formed and some of the key players along the way, okay. what it became. Um, so at Chautauqua, at the institution, some 20, two, three years ago, there was the announcement of the formation of what, is, what was then called the Abrahamic Program. Mm -hmm. And it was an attempt uh, to bring together people of Christian, Jewish, and Islamic backgrounds for meaningful conversation, meaningful dialogue. They since renamed it to the Abrahamic initiative, but essentially the same thing. When it was announced, I, as a Sikh, I, I literally asked the question in a public gathering, well, what about everyone else? And the man who was going out as, as a head of the Department of Religion, my good friend Ross McKenzie, mm -hmm who I had not at that time met, gave a perfectly nice answer in the public forum, but the next day he happened to have run into me. And he said, we gotta talk. And we got together in his office, probably the very next day, and invented this program where we would bring together teachers of spiritual practices from a variety of world religions and wisdom traditions. So our first year we had myself, Ross who was an Episcopal priest, a couple who happened to be in my home even as we're speaking, who are Sufis mm -hmm. from New York, and another fellow who I happened to have run into at a college reunion who was an abbot of a Zen center in New Haven, Connecticut. Wow. And we taught sequentially. We didn't teach together. But the idea of it was that you might come and sit with the Sufis, and the next week you might come and sit with the Episcopal priest, and you'd start to discover what was in common there, what was the heart of the, the mystical heart. Mm -hmm. And since then we've expanded and 
our last normal year, 2019, we had a, as we have had for many years, a nine-week summer program, mm -hmm. and we had uh, three sessions a day, uh, five days a week, plus another session on Sunday. So it added up, I think, to a 144 meditation sessions each summer. Wow, and what would those sessions be like? Well, typically, and we're resu we've resumed in-person now, but at a reduced schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, the teacher will convene whoever is there, um, do some introduction if people need basic instruction, and then lead people in a meditation based on whatever their tradition is. So uh, if someone is involved with what's called contemplative outreach, it's uh, also called centering prayer, and mm -hmm. it was put together by a Catholic priest, they'll lead in that style, which includes reading some scripture, meditating on a, a sacred word, um, basically very simple. If they're a Zen Buddhist teacher, they'll give some basic instruction in Zen practice and then lead often a walking meditation and then a sitting meditation. And we each do our own thing. And, and then you would rotate, rotate through and have each of those experiences. Yes. What, what I'm aiming for, uh, for next year, is to bring some of these things together at this, essentially at the same time, mm -hmm. so that people can, in, let's just say, in rapid succession, experience these different styles. And we want to do some of our program like that so that people who are looking uh, to discover what works for them, we'll have a better opportunity to experience various things. And the fact is that most of the people who come to Chautauqua are come for one or two weeks. Mm -hmm. So if they happen to miss <laughs> the Sufi teacher and they really wanted to be with that person, uh, they'll, they'll have to not have that experience that year. So this should help us to to talk to people where they're at. And try, try different, different yeah. approaches. Yeah. Um, so, so the current plan then is to have the rotation through so that one would have item. Let me ask just one more, two more questions, and I could go on for two hours here. How have your physical capabilities changed at this point in your life? <laughs> what do you attribute to the meditative experience? Well, I would say that my physical condition at this point in my life has um, a lot to do with some of the punishment that I've subjected my body to. <laughs> you know, I was a wrestler and a lacrosse player in college and I've done these trips. I took, you know, real long bike trips and I did a lot of hit backpacking with winter camping along the way. And, you know, all kinds of things that have taken their toll. Mm -hmm. But in terms of meditation in relation to that, it's my relief. It's when I'm not suffering. Mm -hmm. You know, that someone gave me a t-shirt once and it says, pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. Interesting. Yeah, and I think that suffering is what happens when we are in a situation and we really wish it were different? What would happen if you're in a challenging situation and you didn't wish it were different? Now that doesn't mean you don't take appropriate steps. You know, if I break my arm, I'm gonna go have it set. Yeah. But if I'm moaning about, oh, poor me, why did this ever happen? How can I possibly live with this? Then, then, then I'm creating suffering. Pain and suffering are two different things. And meditation is 
never a way to avoid pain, but it's always a way to, to prevent suffering. We don't have to go in that direction. That's our choice. And it, you know, it takes practice. It doesn't happen because you go to a meditation class one day or read a book. Mm -hmm. It happens because you practice mm -hmm. over and over and over again. I've got one last question, okay. easy statement at the end. That is, if a young Chautauquan comes to you, one week Chautauquan, and expresses an interest in experiencing meditation, what would be your advice, your well, counsel? First of all, I'd say, well, come on and sit with us, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I'd also, when, when someone is a clearly new, I try to uh, at least appear to them to be open to having further conversation maybe after the session. Mm -hmm. But I would also say that virtually everywhere in the country, there's somebody who's teaching something, you know. And just find something that feels comfortable to you and then stick with it. There's always the risk of digging a lot of shallow wells and never hitting water, yeah. you know. So find something that appeals, but then what you're gonna discover is there are days you really don't wanna do it. And there are days when you feel so wonderful you don't think you need to do it. And I always just tell people, it doesn't matter. Make a decision I'm going to do this much practice. And I often say, do it for 40 days. Because it takes about that long to create a habit. And if you, if you commit yourself to 10 minutes or two hours of meditation for 40 days, by the end of that time, you'll, you'll understand, assuming you've had good instruction, mm -hmm. you'll understand how it's going to be valuable to you. Mm -hmm. And so that fits. We are out of time. Wow, and went fast. It didn't, it, didn't it though? And I, when I teach psychology, our textbook has a section on meditation where our focus is getting the kids into graduate school doing scientific stuff. <laughs> That's one that normally is covered very quickly. But by getting to know you in our conversation, I realize I need to spend some more time with that, do yep. some more careful reading. Give me a Thank hallway. you so much for sharing, and I will give you a call. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Big great.